NACDL is the Association of the Nation's Criminal Defense Bar. So I am gonna talk about reforms that have happened in the last couple of years, but also why it's a start and not obviously the end of any fight around um, racism or racial justice. As we've talked about all day, and I missed yesterday, but uh, these issues are deeply embedded, not just in the criminal justice system, but in American society overall. And as everyone in this room is well aware, the issues that underlie the criminal justice system and the racial disparity within it have reoriented itself time and time again in the US through different systems of oppression. And the current era of mass incarceration is no different. And I'll give some context for that and, and talk about what needs to be centered as part of this work in order to address whatever comes next to acknowledge that racism will probably continue to underlie it and how we as individual actors within the system can work to address it. This is tough stuff. You know, I was sitting through the last presentation, I was like, wow, this is heavy. And so I appreciated the discussion earlier around trauma and how what we can do as individuals to address the trauma we may experience either through primary or secondary trauma. One way that I um, can process these heavy topics and the statistics that get thrown around and the individual stories that get thrown around is to be in dialogue with other folks who are engaging in this work to learn and um, bear witness to the resiliency that people carry with them in order to strive through this day after day. And so I'm gonna try to leave time at the end for dialogue so that we can process this together so that whatever comments or reactions have been percolating for you today and from yesterday, um, they can be shared um, as we wrap up the seminar because that's how, that's one way, that's not the only way, but that's certainly one way that helps me to process the heaviness of the topics that we get exposed to um, day after day. So I wanna, st I wanna um, let me give you an overview of uh, what I'm gonna talk about, which I'm gonna uh, highlight changes in mass incarceration, reinforce what's already been mentioned in many of the presentations already this afternoon or t throughout the day, the racial disparity in the criminal justice system, highlight recent reforms, talk about next steps in challenging racial disparity, and then leave time at the end for Q&A and dialogue. And as um, we get ready for the end of the seminar, I wanna uh, start with a question um, for you all to sit with, and then when we get into the dialogue part of this part of the discussion, hopefully that can um, help to uh, provoke some responses. And that question is, what actions do you think are possible in the short term to center race in criminal justice reform? So I'm sure most of you are familiar with this graph, um, which charts the, in, the significant growth in the US criminal justice system, particularly starting in the early 1970s. This has happened, and in the last few years, there's been some modest decline in the criminal justice system, and that's been because of criminal justice reforms. So last year, I'm sure many of you are aware, at the federal level, the First Step Act was adopted, which will authorize some sentencing changes in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. There are modest reforms adopted in some states as well. Last year, lawmakers right here in California revisited the felony murder rule for life sentences for persons who weren't the trigger person during a crime. In Florida, voters approved a ballot measure to authorize retroactivity for progressive sentencing changes. Also here in California, at the end of his administration, Governor Brown granted more than 1,100 pardons and more than 150 commutations, far more than any other governor in California history. Because of those modest changes um, uh, that we've observed over the last couple of years, there have been a handful of states that have had significant declines in their criminal justice system, which what we call is decarceration. 
New Jersey leads the top of the list with 37% decline since 1999. The state's prison population peaked in 1999, the highest ever recorded level. Alaska and New York followed also with double digit, over 30% decreases in their state prison population since they peaked in the mid 2000s in New York in 1999. And other states that had double digit increases were Vermont, Connecticut, California. There are also some states on this list that aren't listed um, that had um, higher rates of decrease than other parts of the country, including states like Mississippi, surprisingly, um, and uh, states like South Carolina. And yet, the downsizing that took place, it was achieved through very modest reforms, through reducing readmissions to prison for parole and probation violations, for increasing the pace of uh, release for eligible, for prisoners who are eligible for parole. The First Step Act is fairly modest. There was some um, tension in the federal advocacy community over whether or not the act was strong enough. And the reforms that have been observed in the last couple of years and the modest decline that's been observed in the last couple of years, if the US were to continue to decrease its population, its prison population at that rate, it would take 75 years for the United States re to return to the incarceration levels of the early 1980s, which at the time were still higher than most um, other industrial nations. And so while incarceration trends vary, there continues to be significant rates of incarceration, even in these states that have had successes that have led to these um, double-digit declines. As you all know, the US has the world's highest rate of incarceration, and that's for several reasons. We send people to prison for reasons they don't go to prison for in other parts of the world, and when they do go to prison, they go to prison for longer. Fundamentally, and I'm not, a lawyer, I'm not a lawyer, and so I feel privileged to be invited to the lawyers um, meeting this today, but this is a political problem where strategies must be employed to counter the punitiveness resulting in high levels of incarceration. Countries and within the United States states have the policies and prison populations they choose. Between, 1990, between 1965 and 1990, during which overall and violent crime rates tripled in Germany, Finland, and the US, German politicians chose to hold their imprisonment rate flat, Finnish politicians chose to radically reduce theirs, and American politicians enacted policies to increase the use of, of imprisonment substantially. All American states experienced large crime rate increases in the 1970s through the early 90s, but their responses were different. Politicians in states like Maine, Vermont, and Minnesota by and large resisted calls for harsher um, sentencing practices, where politicians in states like my home state of Texas, the state we're currently in California, Oklahoma, and Florida responded with enthusiasm. We've already um, gone over some of this earlier today, but there are several factors that contribute to incarceration growth, including policing, the increased likelihood of going to prison since the early 80s, longer prison stays due to a range of underlying um, sentencing practices, including the abolition of parole, and policies contributing to recidivism. Since the early 80s, the likelihood that US residents come in contact with the police has increased. And once a person interacts with the police, their likelihood of being arrested has increased, as has their likelihood of going to prison. That's due to a handful of policies that most of you are already familiar with, including the three strikes and you're out policy popularized right here in California through ballot measure. That's increased life sentences for a person convicted on their third felony offense. Most of not all states have similar habitual offender uh, policies. Other policies include not just expansion of mandatory minimums over the last 30 years, but also lengthy time served requirements. And considering that the US and considering the United States in, um, in comparison to other industrialized nations provides good context here. For burglary offenses, the time served in the US on average is 15.2 months considerably longer than that of Scotland, which on average is four, a little over four months, and in Sweden, a little over six months. 
Similarly, for robbery in the US, the average time served is 37 months compared to 10 months in, the ne in Scotland and 12 months in the Netherlands. Other policies that contribute to incarceration growth include the abolition of parole, and prison an increase in prison admissions for parole and probation violations without systems to prevent recidivism, systems that would connect justice-involved individuals to services, helping them with housing and employment, rather than revoke them if they're unable to comply with the conditions of supervision. So what uniquely sets the US apart from other nations in particular is the context of those high rates of incarceration and the criminal justice system, how it has reorganized itself with the purpose of controlling blackness, in particular in persons of color more generally. Prior to the buildup of the nation's prison system, there were other systems of oppression, including slavery, state-sanctioned lynching, segregation during Jim Crow, and the era that we are now in that author Michelle Alexander has termed the new Jim Crow. So the impact to date is statistics and numbers that we're familiar with. The US today has 2.2 million people who are incarcerated in prisons and jails. At year in 2015, over 6.7 million individuals were under some form of correctional control not just in prison or jail, but also under supervision in the community on probation and parole. And those general statistics are often masking the racial disparity that's so prevalent within the system. These statistics are embedded in the criminal justice system for black uh, residents in particular. African Americans are more likely than white residents to be arrested, and once arrested, they are more likely to be convicted, and once convicted, they are more likely to experience longer prison terms. As of 2001, one of every three black boys born in that year could expect to go to prison at some point in his lifetime, as could one of every six Latinos compared to one of every 17 white boys. And African-American adults are 5.9 times as likely to be incarcerated as whites, while, Lat while Latinos are 3.1 times as likely. The underlying causes of these disparities is deeper and more structural than any one individual's bias or use of authority to discriminate at the individual case level. Persons of color and those who are both of color and poor experience a much different criminal justice system than those who are wealthy. Wealthy defendants can buy effective adversaries that ensure the constitutional protections, uh, that ensure their constitutional protections as defendants, yet the experiences of poor defendants of color often differ substantially from that model due to a number of factors that result in racial disparities throughout the system. These racially disparate outcomes are not explicit, but in many ways that makes the racism embedded in the system even more problematic and challenges practitioners and advocates to identify and implement solutions with intention that center racial justice as a guiding principle. The general narrative of the US criminal justice system reinforces a perception that this country protects everyone equally despite the reality that law enforcement interests generally prevail over the rights of residents of color Claims of fairness hide structural realities that should be clear given the nation's prison population is overwhelmingly black and poor. And the underlying social policies contribute to the structural inequalities that are severe in black communities throughout the US. From slavery to redlining to employment discrimination, the United States has unfairly extracted labor from black residents and depressed the ability to accumulate wealth and transfer resources intergenerationally. That persistence of historical experience lives with us today and contributes to that intersectional reality for defendants who are both poor and black and often unable to purchase effective counsel that advantages them throughout the justice system. So behind each of these statistics is a person, is a neighborhood, is a community. I grew up in a community north of Houston and by the time I got to my late teens, early 20s, a lot of the folks that I grew up with had been locked up or justice involved at some point. Behind each percentage point represents a black man who's been disappeared behind the walls because of a criminal conviction. 
Behind each number is a Latina child who has to visit her mother over the next couple of years because she's been locked away in a, de in a detention center. These numbers have profound impact on not just the people who are incarcerated or formerly incarcerated, but also the families they live behind, and as we learned and discussed earlier today, the trauma that people are carrying with them. There are reasons for this disparity, some we've already touched on today. Policing, pretrial um, policies, sentencing practices, and parole, as well as collateral consequences and a range of um, other interactions that happen to people during their justice involvement. With policing in particular, mass incarceration begins with disproportionate levels of police contact with African American residents. The National Academy of Sciences found in a well-regarded study from 2014 that Americans have experienced an increased likelihood of police contact since the early, since the early 1980s. Drug enforcement has been one contributing factor to increased police contact. More than one in four people were arrested for drug law violations in 2015 were black, although drug use rates do not differ substantially by race and ethnicity, and drug users generally purchase drugs from people of the same race or ethnicity. In New York City, like many cities, um, remains reluctant to scale back the broken windows policing. Between 2001 and 2013, 51% of the city's population over the age of 16 was black or Latino, yet 82% of the persons during that period were arrested for misdemeanor offenses. And we heard earlier today about Ferguson, where police practices don't just, aren't just done in the name of public safety, but also with explicit discriminatory goals. For example, and we heard this from at least, several, at least two prisoners earlier um, today, that uh, in Ferguson, the law enforcement practices were shaped by the city's focus on revenue rather than public safety and deterrence. Under pretrial, uh, black Americans were incarcerated in local jails at a rate of 3.5 times the rate of non-Hispanic whites in 2016. And these disparities are due in part to policing, but also exacerbated by practices surfaced at this point of the criminal justice process. 70% of pretrial releases require money bond, a significant barrier for low-income defendants, most of whom are disproportionately of color. Sentencing, under sentencing, African Americans and Latinos comprise 29% of the general population in the US, but make up 60% of the country's prison population. And those racial disparities are also due in part to policing and pretrial practices, but are also compounded by the discretionary practices that happen at sentencing. What I'm sure is not surprising to any of you is the prosecutorial bias that can lead to overcharging, particularly to defendants of color. At the federal level, uh, prosecutors are twice as likely to charge black defendants with the mandatory minimum, with the, an offense that carries a mandatory minimum. And at the state level, prosecutors are, um, are more likely to charge black defendants under habitual offender laws. Policies that disadvantage black defendants at the time of sentencing include charging defendants with offenses in sentencing enhancement zones, and we um, heard a little bit about that in the earlier presentation that touched on the criminal justice system and Native Americans. But sentencing enhancement zones are prevalent in every state around the country, and as you all know, drug free, if um, offenses are charged within drug-free school zones, that can be used to overcharge and increase um, charges for, for defendants, many of whom are black and Latino. New Jersey lawmakers revisited their drug-free school zone several years ago when a study found that 96% of the defendants subjected to these enhancements were African American or Latino. And as I mentioned, all 50 states have some form of sentencing enhancement, including and also the District of Columbia. Parole is also another factor that's, in, that's led to an increase in the incarceration growth and underlies the racial disparity in the system. Since the 90s, many states have abolished their parole system and the proportion of the prison 
system that's eligible for discretionary release has gone down. There's also racial bias at points of discretion in these discretionary release um, practices. So a few years ago, following the suicide of a, a parole-eligible prisoner in New York who had been denied parole um, for many years, over 20 um, times during his incarceration, the New York Times conducted an analysis to look at the behavior between parole officers and parole-eligible prisoners in that state and found that 60,000 disciplinary decisions uh, were dependent upon a guard's bias, like disobeying a direct order, and that within those findings, there was significant racial bias that disadvantaged African-American prisoners. Also, policies within parole include underinvestment and racial disparities that persist in community supervision. Supervision in the US um, operates as an extension of law enforcement that I'm sure is surprising to no one in this room. Whereas in other countries like Germany and um, Sweden, parole and supervision connect just as involved residents to services for housing and employment. Here, uh, parole officers and probation officers are um, quasi-law enforcement and are, have a very adversarial relationship to the people that they're supervising. And as a result, that system um, continues to, as you all know, continues to help churn people in and out of prison and contributes to, has, in, has contributed to increased prison admissions. Collateral consequences are also a reason for the racial disparity in the criminal justice system and within mass incarceration. Black residents, and in particular black men, um, are most exposed to these collateral consequences, often associated with housing and employment. Other uh, collateral consequences include voting bans and um, ineligibility for public benefits and other services. So these factors persist even in the context of recent changes and reforms that have led to double-digit declines in the criminal in some states, such as New Jersey, that I mentioned earlier, and has led to a modest decline in the overall nation's prison population. But you know, New Jersey offers a cautionary tale because while there was a significant decline, and um, since '99 to 2016, there's a 37 percent decline. This overview provides a, looks at a shorter window of time where 26% decline from 1999 to 2012, and during that same period of time, that state was found to have the highest rate of racial disparity in its prison population, a rate of incarceration for black residents 12 times the rate of incarceration for white residents, which points to even in states where there has been successful criminal justice reform, if intentional efforts aren't made to undo the underlying factors that lead to racial disparity, you won't solve the racial disparity in the system. So given the lack of political possibility in targeting a reduction in racial disparity in incarceration, as of 2016, black residents in New Jersey were still highly likely um, to be incarcerated than their white counterparts in the community. And as someone who's worked on criminal justice reform campaigns, I know it is challenging to center race as why the system needs to be fixed. Lawmakers and advocates often shy away from the, from the explicit demands to enact structural reforms that are explicit in their aim to undo the racially disparate outcomes that are so pervasive in the criminal justice system. And yet, if we're not explicit about it, if we're not intentional about it, stories like New Jersey will continue and the racial disparity won't be addressed. So what are these solutions to address racial disparity? What opportunities might there be for us to be intentional and work actively to try to undo um, the problem that leads and exacerbates race within the system? In the short term, state and local residents can work intentionally to address that racial disparity. Cities and towns can reform law enforcement by reducing over-policing and prioritize community approaches. In response to increases in homicide, local governments can target initiatives to young men most at risk and also um, most at risk of committing violence and at risk of being victimized by violence. 
Those services could include workforce initiatives that pay a living wage, center the interest of young men who, and their interest in what might come next in their career tra trajectory, and prepare par uh, participants not just for work today, but also lifelong learning and the careers that will carry them through the rest of their life. Policy reforms could also eliminate unfair cash bail requirements and develop and enhance legal capacity for attorneys to effectively represent low-income defendants. State lawmakers can revisit and reform policies that were promised um, to seem race neutral, but result in disparate outcomes like risk assessments, gang enhancements, and location-based um, drug penalties. Solutions also include a presumption towards pretrial release for defendants and connecting justice-involved residents to services with the goal of public safety, repealing sentencing enhancements and acknowledging the impact of over-policing and its contribution to a cumulative prior record history and penalizing drug offenses based on culpability, not location. Lawmakers could fundamentally reorient criminal justice policy and consider enacting um, policies on how race has played a role in the legislative process and underlies the criminal justice system. Requiring racial impact statements could get at that. Those statements are similar to fiscal and environmental impact statements and would be provided to lawmakers for consideration prior to the adoption of any new criminal justice law or regulation, and a handful of states have adopted these policies, most recently New Jersey, as a way to address that high rate of disparity. Other states that have adopted racial impact statements include Iowa, Connecticut, and Minnesota. The defense bar has a role too, and I'm so gl uh, glad that I was able to sit through uh, many of the presentations this today and learn how you all are thinking about roles, um, ways that your individual case advocacy and some of the systemic solutions that were um, suggested here today. The individual cases that make up your practices add to the narrative that residents deserve, can add to the narrative of what residents deserve, regardless of race in the US. So I know earlier um, other presenters were suggesting to, for you all to mine data, to, to collect data and contribute that data um, to coalition efforts and other conversations, that is really helpful and critical and can and certainly be useful in organizing um, narratives around not just criminal justice reform, but also addressing the racial uh, disparity that is so embedded within the criminal justice system. Supporting legal capacity for low-income defendants, of course, particularly defendants of color through, this, uh, through a robust public defense system will be critical. And at the case level, centering racial inequality regularly to enhance the narrative will affirm the underlying structures that result in racial inequality. Contributing to policy discussions are important. They can help personalize the collective experiences that get debated and developed with community organizers and in um, collaboration with policy advocates. So I know that attorneys with active caseloads are busy doing that individual case advocacy, but uh, you know, in many of your states, if not all of them, there's active criminal justice coalitions and to the extent that you have capacity, figuring out ways to support and connect to those coalitions is, is incredibly critical and necessary. So, Again, I'm gonna wrap up my comments, and I think we have time for discussion and dialogue, and I wanna restate the question that I um, started with at the beginning, and that is, what actions do you think are possible in the short term to center race within reform that challenge racial disparity in the criminal justice system? Those are really good points. So nationally, 8% of people are incarcerated in private prisons. So it's a problem, but it's um, the scale of people in private prisons is fairly modest when you consider the 2.2 million people who are incarcerated on a given day. It's not to say that active campaigns in eliminating private prisons as a social policy isn't a worthy goal, but eliminating them alone won't undo mass incarceration, particularly given what I hoped was clear and that I'll reinforce that the current iteration of mass incarceration has just been the way that the United States has reoriented systems of oppression, particularly when considering the social control 
of black residents and blackness. On your point around the franchise for people who are in prison, surprisingly, there has been new activity around that. So there's active legislation also in New Jersey that, you know, it's not, I'm not a resident of New Jersey, so I don't know who in the room is from New Jersey. Is anyone here from New Jersey? Nobody. Okay, well, I know I've mentioned New Jersey a lot, but there's actually active legislation in New Jersey that would expand the franchise to people who are in prison. And we thought that those, the folks organizing around that were radical and sort of in a lane of their own. But surprisingly, in the last couple of years, a handful of other states have introduced legislation around that. Actually, in California, there's an active effort to expand the franchise to incarcerated individuals and also to people on parole. And most recently, there was legislation introduced in New Mexico and also in Hawaii. So yes, to that, to the extent that more campaigns can develop and uh, to expand the franchise to incarcerated residents, that would certainly be a step in the right direction and, and would help to build out um, a conversation related to these issues. Sir, yep. Both, of, both great points. So the Sentencing Project, we launched a campaign late last year on the campaign 10 life imprisonment. And most of the people sentenced to life prison terms have been convicted of very serious offenses, homicide, other serious um, assaults of offenses. So hopefully um, a public education campaign related to that can help address violence and people convicted for violence and create space, political and rhetorical space for those prison terms to be looked at as well. And we're hopeful for that. For people interested, you can visit that campaign website online at endlifeimprisonment.org. And actually my colleague, Mark Maurer, was on The Daily Show earlier this week on Tuesday, um, January 8th. So you can look at the interview with Mark Maurer and Trevor Noah where he discusses life imprisonment and why it's important for the US to even revisit the punitive sentences for violent offenses. And on justice reinvestment, I mean, one, one um, opportunity I think for progressive groups for criminal justice reform coalitions under the justice reinvestment narrative is for communities that are directly impacted by these high rates of incarceration to be having conversations about reclaiming the savings, claiming the savings that are associated with prison population reductions and prison closures. Those conversations and community coalitions, you know, led by the Black Lives Matter activists, led by, you know, grassroots um, activists in North Carolina and other parts of the country, I hope that they're following the money, that they're paying attention to the money, that it's not just a conversation about private prisons and ending them, but also what is done in our names with the public resources that get spent on prisons and jails every year and have been spent on policing, and that if states are successful at reducing the number of people in prison, that that money should be reclaimed by the communities that have been most harmed by them. And I think that there's longer conversations to be had with not just the extraction of people from community that have been disappeared behind prison and jails, but also the extraction of resources. So some of the prisoners talked about the unfair tax that law, that justice involved residents um, are experiencing with the, fines and, with the fines and fees and other criminal court debt. So in some ways, these issues are bigger than criminal, just the criminal justice system and just someone's individual arrest history or just like the rate of arrest and policing practices. And so I think that those, you know, that might be worth an entire, you know, day long conversation where people are really thinking through and digging into what it means to claim the resources that have been extracted and spent in the name that have helped to build up the largest prison population in the world. Yeah. That's why the Ferguson report is so important. And in some ways, there should be reports like that for every municipality, every county and city around the country. Obviously, under this administration, that's not possible and that won't happen. But even under the, even under the Obama administration, there could have been you know, a great deal more work done and investigations um, done. That's why I think the expansion of Medicaid under Obamacare was one policy solution that could help support that, support the expansion of connection to treatment services for justice-involved residents. 
and then um, centering public health, not just when it comes to substance abuse treatment, but also when it comes to violence, to the um, uh, gentleman's comment earlier. So there's been an entire, there's been an emerging area of work around preventing and containing violence as a public health strategy and you leveraging resources that are available through the expansion of Medicaid and other public health systems to support that. But to the point of improving how that's staffed and like the training through the level of experience that those providers are, um, who are entrusted with that. And then also making sure that the right level of treatment is a part of the conversation. I think that's unexplored. Um, because it's emerging, and so I think that that offers a challenge as this conversa as these conversations move forward. Yes, <laughs> and you know it's going to be interesting when Kamala announces what the reaction to her will be because she is a prosecutor, and so given that, given where the uh, where the Democratic Party is, and I'm you know sentencing project nonpartisan. Let me just say that since we're being recorded. But it'll be interesting to see like what the left wing of the party, how they react to her, particularly given her history as a prosecutor here in California. So I think one of the opportunities from the movement to elect progressive prosecutors, which I think is a question how that will play out and how progressive are they really, is Larry Krasner a unicorn or will other elected DAs choose to govern in the same way that he's chosen to govern since he um, uh, when it got into office. But given this new field of progressive prosecutors, it, would, it may offer political um, opportunity that progressive coalition, progressive prosecutor coalitions can work to undo the conservative tough on crime prosecutor coalition. So I'm just thinking about Missouri and Wesley Bell in that state who was elected in St. Louis County. He wasn't the only progressive prosecutor elected in Missouri. My understanding is that two other progressive prosecutors were elected in that state at the county level. So if they could sort of work as a mini coalition to counter the tough on crime prosecutor contingency in that state, then you know that offers a political, that might surface a political question. And similarly, and how could that play out in other states as well? Because prosecutors are elected officials that do have significant amount of power and have consolidated that power. So the question for criminal justice reform is how to disrupt that. And what strategies can we put in place in the short term, but also for long term political discussions around how to um, sort of tease out that tension with the hope of providing more balance in the system. So that's a good question and something for us to all think about. And I know something a lot of folks are struggling with and, and working with um, these days. So I think this is the last question and comment because it is five o'clock on a Friday and uh, we want to let people get on with the rest of their day and evening. But yes, ma'am. Yes. I mean, I think it fits into some of these other su suggestions that have been raised and sorts of um, gives an opportunity for you all as advocates, not just legal advocates with your various practices, but also in collaboration with criminal justice reform coalitions and other organizing and policy discussions about how to lift some of these ideas up from decriminalization and repealing some of the criminal statutes that are already on the books, from organizing around a progressive prosecutor strategy, from claiming the resources that might be um, realized because of a reduction in a prison population or a prison closure. So these all offer um, some opportunities and I think it's for us all to work on together. Obviously, this is the title of this conference was Race Matters Too. So that's a challenge to us all to not just leave here with some of this new information and these heavy statistics and this heavy information, but also to figure out ways to actively work in these spaces going forward so that we can help contribute to it. And when we come back for Race Matters 3, we'll have some new um, stories to share and some new campaigns to celebrate. So thank you all. Thanks for staying.